Well, hello. Um, my name is Tom Rose. I'm an Admiral Nurse Clinical Lead at St Barnabas Hospice in Lincoln. I'm a mental health nurse by background and also a Queen's nurse. I've been an Admiral Nurse for about five years uh, and I'm here today to talk about person-centred care. And this is going to be less of a talk about how we deliver person-centred care, more about a discussion about what is person-centred care and what's the relevance to our own practice. So today we're going to touch on three little bits. We're going to talk a little bit about what is person-centred care. We're going to touch on identity, self and personhood, and then wrap up with the power of a cup of tea. And before we start that, I thought it might be useful to sort of share a little bit about the thought processes that have come to together um, when I wrote a couple of articles that have formed the basis of this discussion. So one of the discussions we were having within St Barnabas was how do we improve the care we offer to people who may self-identify with the protected characteristics? How do we elicit that information sensitively? And also at the same time as having thoughts about what, what does person-centred care actually mean at the end of the day? You know, fundamentally, what's the basis for, for person-centred care? And I was also thinking about, uh, in relation to, to protected characteristics, how identity and dementia might affect each other, how they impact on the, um, the everyday life and experience of dementia. So as I said, that, that uh, accumulated in, in a couple of articles, and that's kind of the basis for, for today's talk. So what is person-centred care? What do we mean by that? What, you know, it's, it's a commonly used phrase um, these days, uh, most often in dementia care, but also in other health and social care services. So what does it actually mean? Well, there is no single definition. Um, and my feelings on this is, is that it needs to be adaptable. It needs to be reflective of the situation um, that we're discussing. But if we look at some of the documentation out there, then the, the Health and Improvement Network wrote about person-centred care as being a way of thinking and doing things that sees people as equal partners and monitoring their care needs. NHS England talked about person-centred care being about focusing on the needs of the individual, ensuring that person's preferences and values guide clinical decisions and provide care that's responsive to them. The BGS talk about philosophy of person-centred care that promotes well-being and minimises distress through meeting that fundamental, the fundamental needs for that person. Dawn Brooker, when writing about person-centred care, talks about the, the VIPs framework, which are elements that on their own, but also collectively, support good person-centred care, such as valuing and asserting the absolute value of human life, recognising the individualness of in people, understanding people's perspectives, and also the social environment that supports that person's needs. So, so what? So what does that actually mean? So to me, person-centred care is an approach that helps preserve and enhance personhood, that improves the quality of life and the well-being and to the benefit of families and carers as well. But some of the thought processes that I was having um, when writing those articles was about well, what, what's underlying that? What's some of the sort of theory and some of the, the, the concepts that underlie person-centred care. And central to that was what makes us unique? What makes us an individual? And how does this impact person-centred care? So the first thing I looked at was about identity. And when I talk about identity, one of those fundamental questions is who am I? How do I describe myself? And if I asked the people watching this video, to list or write a list of words that describes themselves. Would you write words that describe your physical self, the bits that, of your life that you're proud of or not so proud of, bits of your life that are baked in, um, in terms of, of your upbringing, your background? Are they things that you've chosen or things that you've developed as life has continued? So those identity traits, those characteristics, give us a sense of who we are. They give us a sense of where we belong and what we might value. An identity can be based on things such as gender, 
racial identity, national identity, professional identity, hobbies, social groups, all these different factors can blend together to make our individual identity. But because of that, identity is dynamic and it's constructed through the social interactions and personal experiences that we have. So today I'm talking to you using my professional identity, those elements and traits within myself that come together to help me be who I am in a work environment. This evening I will be expressing my family identity. I will be talking to my wife, I will be playing with my child and I will be a very different person to who I am now, but I will also be the same person. So we have multiple and overlapping identities and we express those in different situations in different roles. So when we're talking about identity, we're talking about the distinctive characteristics which belong to each of us, or they may be shared with members of a particular group or category. And the thought that I want you to have about identity is how do those characteristics, how do they inform who we are now? How do they inform the choices that we might make now? And one of the ways that we might do that is through the consideration of self. And self uh, or selfhood, which are, are two slightly different concepts, but in, in the relation to this, we're talking about self. We're talking about that perception and the evaluation of all those identity traits. How do we feel about those characteristics which we might have listed before? Do we feel positive about them or do we feel negative about them? Do we feel that there's conflict within those identity traits? So self can be very complex, and dynamic, and it changes and adapts over time. Having a sense of self gives us a sense of agency and autonomy, that ability to do things for ourselves as unique individuals or do things within a group collectively. And it also gives us a sense of continuity. And that continuity, there's, a, there's often a sense of duality within that. Am I the same person that I was 20 years ago? Well, physically, I am. I am inhabit the same body. I can remember who I was 20 years ago. I can remember what I was doing 20 years ago. But would I make those same choices? Would I evaluate my life in the same way? Well, no, I wouldn't. I am a different person to the person I was 20 years ago, although I inhabit the same body. So there is a duality within that, and that's an important thing to consider in relation to dementia. That physical person remains. But are they the same person now as they were 20 years ago? Are they the same person as they were prior to diagnosis? Are they the same person as they were 50, 60, however many years ago? Which self do we engage with? Which person are we supporting? So we can divide self up as well into our physical and our psychological and our spiritual selves. And again, they're expressions of elements of our identity in different contexts and different situations. And I just want to dive a little bit more into the theory of that and talking about Harare's trinity of self. And I possibly uh, mangled that pronunciation. So do we have some different selves? Well, Harare talked about a trinity of self. He talked about the physical, the cognitive and the social self. So I mentioned already about that physical continuity. I am the same person physically that I was 20 years ago. I inhabit this body, this, this expression of me. And that is very intrinsic to who we are. I recognise myself as a distinct individual, physically separate from you and from the people around me. I express that through talking about myself and I and the thought processes that underlie that. And we can express it through body language and it's not reliant on other cognitive processes. And we talk about the cognitive self as well. So our construction of our identity, those choices, attributes, self-perception of ourselves. And we can derive that from our life history. I remember the things that came before and that summation of everything that comes to now. 
and it connects as well with those beliefs about ourselves. Do we have a high value of ourselves and those things that we've done or do we not? And then there's the social self as well, our social persona and the, the adoption of roles, such as the role of nurse, the role of parent, the role of whatever. But it's also crucially that social self, which is that engagement with other people around us and how people value us and how we perceive the worth of other people. And this is quite crucial in dementia care, because one of the things we often encounter when supporting people with dementia is a stigmatising uh, narrative that views people with dementia as worthless than, than other people, very sadly. And this is where some of that engagement comes. So if we view people as worthless, we're diminishing their self, their social self. And if you imagine somebody whose cognitive self is becoming fragmented because some of those choices and attributes throughout life have become disjointed and the social self is reduced because of the way we're engaging with somebody, then what impact might that have on that person's own sense of well-being and sense of self-worth? If their sense of self, of who they are, those choices they've made are fragmented and dismissed, what then is left for that person? So then we can talk about personhood as well. So personhood is a legal and ethical recognition of a person, an individual with rights, liabilities, responsibilities and so forth. When we look at Kitwood's work on personhood, we talk about a standing and a status. So think about the social self, the standing of the status that's bestowed upon one human by another in the context of relation and being a social being. So that's a recognition of personhood given by another person. So there's a social and moral definition there. There's also an argument about personhood being intrinsic to who we are. We have personhood simply by being an individual and a person. And we base that on our self-worth and our dignity and our rights as individuals. But whichever the coin side of the coin we fall on on that, we're talking about personhood being an acknowledgement and of respecting an individual and a recognition of that individual and a desire to belong to something more than just ourselves. And it's that recognition of identity and the identity of others, which is crucial within that. So I've already alluded to it, but how might we, how might personhood be removed? If we're talking about a status, a positive status that is bestowed upon another being, if that recognition is not forthcoming, how might that affect that personhood of the person? If that person's self-worth, if their intrinsic belief in themselves is diminished, how might that affect their personhood, sense of self and identity? And these are quite key issues within dementia. So how does dementia impact identity, self and personhood? It affects all three and it affects the, the, the identity and self and personhood of the whole family as well. So identity can be impacted when recall and communication is affected. So if we can't remember some of those choices, we can't remember some of those values, decisions that we've made in our life. How does that affect our identity now? Do we have the same sense of self that we had 20 years ago? And as I've said, which self are we connecting with at that moment? So cognitive changes challenge that sense of self and it can lead to a loss of self-worth and some uncertainty in who we are. I don't know who I am anymore if I can't remember some of those those choices or those choices seem foggy or, or uh, difficult to grasp. And that personhood is challenged, as I said, by stigmatising behaviours and diagnostic overshadowing in that belief that we often see that somebody with dementia is not worth as much as somebody without, even if that thought process isn't always conscious. And as I've said, family members can lose their established role 
that established identity within a group by taking on a caring role, which perhaps they didn't recognise that they, or didn't understand that that might be something they would have to do. And what if they are witnessing that uncertainty within another person? How does that affect their social self and that engagement with somebody? So how does person-centred care counteract that? How do we mitigate some of these issues? Well, when we talk about identity, person-centred care can help preserve and enhance a person's identity by acknowledging their unique history, their unique biology, their culture, and that personality of a person. By understanding all those choices and that summation of all those things that have come before to make that person who's in front of you there. We can support self through person-centred care by maintaining and respecting and supporting those pers that person's feelings in the moment and how, again, that identity has created that person's sense of self. We can promote that person's choice and control within their identity and sense of self. We can support their social self by recognising their self-worth. And we can support persons by affirming the dignity and the rights of that person with dementia to be treated in just the way that we would treat anybody else, by recognising them as an individual. And we can support carers and family members through person-centred care by respecting and supporting their own sense of self, their own identity and their own preferences about care provision and social engagement and understand how dementia is impacting their own sense of personhood. And there are interventions that we can use to do that. So if we're talking about identity, we can look at things like life story work, helping people recall those decisions that they've made, the things that they are most proud of, the things that they are most important to them, maybe the things that they're not so proud of, but are still fundamental in creating who they are today. We do um, sort of a lighter touch as well through reminiscence work and things like personalised music. You know, what is it that the, that person connects with you? How do they choose make those choices? We can promote sense of self through communication boards to aid decisions, or in fact, add decisions, as it says there. We can support cognitive self, again, by supporting identity, by helping that person recall those choices and express those choices through who they are. And we can recognise that self and recognise how our own interactions impact on self. We can recognise and support personhood by how we approach communication, how we recognise our own interactions with a person and how that affirms that person's personhood. But we can also recognise it about how we conceive and think about the people that we support. Are we thinking about them as an individual with person with needs and an identity? Or are we thinking about them as a person with dementia that we need to do something to rather than something with? And we can also support carers through person-centred care by acknowledging their vital role, as I've said, by listening and incorporating their preferences and needs into care. And we can do that in a variety of ways. We can do it through environmental design and assistive technology, through support groups, respite care, and all sorts of different ways. So there are interventions to support person-centred care, which support identity, self, personhood, and carers. So what is person-centred care? To me, it's a recognition of that person's individuality. It's a recognition of what makes that person unique, their own values and preferences, their needs and goals. And what is it that's brought them to this point? That summation, that funneling of everything that that person has experienced into this moment in time. How does that come out and how do we support that? So how do we tailor care, or, we, or rather we should be tailoring care, to recognise and respect all those different factors in that summation? And so person-centred care is not static because identity is not static and self is not static. 
It's an involving and dynamic concept that requires a consistent, sorry, a constant reflection and adaptation of who we are and how we deliver care. And fundamentally to me, person-centred care is an emphasis on communication and relationships with the people that we're supporting. And I, I just want to focus lastly on one part of that, how we support carers, how we support family members through the power of a cup of tea. Last year, I had the, the great pleasure of meeting Wendy Mitchell a couple of times and, and doing a presentation with her. And one of the things um, that always struck me um, in, in listening to her and reading her books was about the, the, a cup of tea. How do we use a cup of tea um, in our engagements with people? So in her book, she talked about the, the sensory element of having a cup of tea. It wasn't just about that need to hydrate. It was about having the, the, the warm hug in the mug. It's about sitting there with a cup of tea savouring the ritual, savouring the taste and the sensation and having that feeling of, of connection. And when we sometimes when we talk about person-centred care or interventions to, to support person-centred care, sometimes people feel that, that needs to be a very involved, very long, very evidence-based interaction. And that has, there is validity in that. But person-centred care it's also about everyday interactions. And one of those basic everyday interactions is sharing a cup of tea. And again, this is another thought process I was having at the time about how we engage with people in those simple moments. And often when we go and visit people at home or when we, you know, we, we have um, people in our hospitals or clinics or wherever it may be, we may offer them a cup of tea. It's a social interaction. It's a a thing we do when we're supporting people or showing empathy and concern, let's go and have a cup of tea. So sharing a cup of tea offers a moment of connection. It creates a moment of shared experience that is separate from what's going on around us. The research shows us that it helps build relationships and rapport. It helps us build trust and empathy in those moments of connections. It helps, perfect, helps create a therapeutic environment and it helps create therapeutic communication. But even basic things, having a cup of tea can support the pacing of a conversation. Conversations don't have to be quick, although sometimes circumstances mean that they need to be, but it can support the pacing of a conversation. Having a slurp of tea forces us to have a pause. It forces us to have a think about what comes next. So it helps the communication process and it supports how we uh, engage with conversation. It can be used as, an, as a mindfulness tool as well. Think about the sensory sensation, sensory sensation of that cup of tea. How do we feel that warmth? How do we smell? How do we go through that ritual? So sharing a cup of tea with somebody, particularly in a moment that can be very frantic, that the it can be very difficult for the person that we're seeing, can support person-centred care because we're giving space and recognition and telling that person, this time is yours. I am here to support you. I want to understand yourself. I want to understand and consider your identity. And I want to respect the things that you bring to the caring role. And I want to support those. So everyday interactions, having a cup of tea is person-centred care. So lastly then, I've got a reflection and a challenge for you. So person-centred care is more about asking somebody whether they want a cup of tea. It involves concepts of selfhood, identity and personhood. Simple interactions can support and reinforce our positive regard for people and our respect for that person's identity and selfhood. And person-centred care needs to engage with those things in order to be person-centred. So my challenge to you is how do you and how do we collectively consider our own identity in the care we provide? How do we let our choices shine through in who we are and who we engage with other people? How do we project our social selves 
into what we do? And how do we become a person-centred organisation? And does your recognition of your own colleagues' selfhood, of their identity, impact on their well-being and your own? Thank you very much.